uh, a report that was published in the New York Times in 1998 when he got the award. It is very interesting when you read it today. He says, because this is 1998, and you contrast this in the, in the debate about the food security bill and well-fed industrialists telling you this is the not time to do food security bill. As it's, people have suddenly become advisors of public policy. They who are the cream of this creamy layer and the absolute benefit, beneficiaries of this state are now telling us when you can give schemes for the poor or not. So the New York Times correspondent then says, in 1998 he says, partly because of Amartya Sen's finding, governments now focus less on direct distribution of food and more on replacing the lost income of the poor through, uh, through for example, public works progress the projects. There couldn't have been a better definition of Nerega with all its faults. There couldn't have been a better definition of the food security bill in 1998 and not by any Indian journalist, by a New York Times correspondent. And the same correspondent says, the questions that Sen asked in the course of his career listed by the Academy, by the way, if you go to the Nobel Academy website, you can get the citations for all the Nobel laureates. You can download it, you may not want to read it now, but sometime in your life, you may want to go back and read it. The, in the listed by the Academy in its press announcement and often posed in dense, mathematically demanding treatise, convey the flavor of his work. How can societies make majority decisions without infringing the rights of dissenting minorities. Extremely important in a country like ours. What measures of inequality are meaningful? What measures of inequality are meaningful? How can we decide whether poverty is declining or increasing? What causes famine? Of course, he has a long section on how sense focus on gender equality has saved actually around the world millions of lives of women simply because the unequal approach even to feeding the male child and the female child is used to lead to a lot of female, inf inf uh, female mortality um, when they are children, when they are older and so forth. And this 1998 article of, in the New York Times mentions this as one of his great contributions. So I'm not going to summarize the very large corpus of sense work in this lecture, nor is it possible to do. If maybe our department with the other social science departments wants to get an Amartya Sen study group, I'll bring you some of the best economists in the country to come and lecture to you. But you take the initiative. You take the, show the intellectual interest. And you show the time to do it. Not, you know, maybe an extra hours before the class or after the class. Why? So I'm not going into his debate. But in the context of what I said that the Sen Bhagwati debate is in, in relation to the Gujarat story, I will take up his very important contribution to a work which is continuously underlined all his other work, what he calls development as freedom. And that to me is extremely important because the debate today is not about development. It is about freedom. In the name of development, freedom is going to be contained. Not my freedom. My days are over. Not the freedom of the older generation sitting here, but your freedom. And we look at it. Um, but before that, one little curiosity, because I somehow conscious I'm speaking to students. I don't want to uh, not c cover the intellectual arena. And this is extremely important. Uh, Sen's work was very much influenced by Kenneth Arrow's impossibility theorem. He agreed with Arrow's impossibility theorem. I'll tell you what the theorem is. But he then developed his entire theoretical work on trying to show why that theorem was not complete. Uh, Sukumar Chakravarti was the one. I mentioned Sukumar Chakravarti earlier. I'm, I'm really hoping that we will have a Sukumar Chakravarti chair in our university. I've been talking to successive vice chancellors, but that's one of my big dreams, that our university should have a Sukumar Chakravarti chair at the economics department. And let's hope he succeed. Maybe before the 100th anniversary celebration of this university. Sukuma Chakravarti was the one who drew Sen's attention to Kenneth Arrow's book called Social Choice and Individual Values, which he got interested, got fascinated by Kenneth Arrow's intellectual work. 
And then, of course, he read his impossibility theorem. And what was Kenneth Arrow's impossibility theorem? Very important and very relevant. Kenneth Arrow said, postulated, using mathematical models, under certain intrinsically set of conditions, intrinsical conditions, democratic choice is not possible, and there will always be a dictator whose choice determines social choice. And I'll read this again. Arrow's impossibility theorem postulates that under certain intrins not intrinsic set of conditions, democratic choice is impossible, and there will always be a dictator whose choice determines social choice. I'm sure many of you who travel by bus to your uh, uh, native, wherever you live in the state, and if the bus breaks down, you'll hear somebody say, oh, we need military rule. Of course, the military is also standing behind now. Ex-generals are now publicly coming up without any shyness. They say, we need military rule. We need strong rule. Only then this country will run. We should go back to the British. We cannot govern ourselves. And everybody will meekly shake their head. Yes, yes, sir. You're right. You're right. You want to fix the problem of the bus on the road, but you want to fix this grand governance problem. And we talk about governance. And this is what he, through his impossibility theorem, said that dictators can only solve problems, not democratic choices. But what Sen did was, from that work, using the mathematical work, he built up his fantastic body of work through his entire life on social choice, on the whole critique of rational choice, and contributed to welfare economics, a new trend in welfare economics on choice theory by seeing the need to probe more carefully the analytical foundations of rational choice. Rational choice might be a good theory, but what is it based on? How do you come to rational choice? And the behavior basis, behavioral basis of economic theory. I think uh, Rupa, who introduced me, is using behavioral economics in our PhD. And we perhaps need to teach more of it because a lot of behavioral economics also influences rational choice and social choice theory in terms of welfare. And Sen held in relation to India, he said two things, and I think are relevant today. He said our biggest achievement is democracy. And I entirely agree with it. I'm willing to give my life for it. I will. I can save this in any public forum because your future, your existence in the state university, when state universities are deliberately being dumbed down and people are asked to go to private universities, stands today because of democracy the ability to do democratic debate, the ability that governments will not stealthily bring, like the previous government in the state did, of introducing five private university bills without even a discussion in the assembly. Democracy is central. And state institutions are central. State universities are central. Where will all of you sitting, our children, other children, get education if access to education, higher education, is not provided by the state universities? And for that, democracy is important. Don't get carried away by the attacks on democracy comes from whatever basis. Then his next, he said, that is the best success of uh, India. But he said our biggest failure is social inequality. And I agree. That is the uh, millstone around our neck. That will what either bury us or take us to the future. And you cannot do anything in this country without addressing the problems of inequality, whether it be social, economic, cultural, intergroup, intra-group, so on and so forth. And every government, whatever you call it, populist, corruption, this, that, because of the democratic nature of the society, and because there still survives some democratic choice in making decisions, has to address these questions of inequality, other than being founded in our constitution, which I'll come to later. Sen Bhagwati and uh, this is why I think uh, you know, the kind of attacks on trying to take away inequality and so on are also enmeshed in this debate about Sen and Bhagwati. And behind all this is the so-called Gujarat model and Narendra Modi. I know I'm speaking in a university, and we generally say we are supposed to be objective. Of course, then objective falls flat in the face of ideology and worldview. But this is a necessary debate. Why did the Gujarat model come up? Ask yourself the question. Why is it being hammered on us? Why is it suddenly being talked as the panacea for everything in this country? It's a very, very simple answer. After 2002, 
the riots of 2002 in Gujarat, the killings of innocent citizens. Over two lakh citizens are still in refugee camps, unattended for, with no basic facilities in terms of sanitation facilities, health facilities. There was a problem of Gujarat being able to raise international investments. Though in the international investments ranking, they are not anywhere number one, but quite that apart. There was the problem of the image of the chief minister and the problem of the image of Gujarat. So you have fixers for everything. You have spin doctors for everything. Today, we don't have journalists. We have spin doctors. Journalists don't write what I talk. If there are journalists here, please don't misunderstand me. Because I've had, I've had experiences of my talk being written in another way to suit the opinion of the journalist. In the last Teachers' Day meeting, I took strong position against the anti-corruption groups. I am against corruption. But I took very strong intellectual position on what was the dangers of the kind of anti-corruption movement that was in the country at that point in time. And I stand by it. But that was again slightly tweaked. These are the spin doctors. So Mr. Modi had spin doctors. He now has one of the largest public relations company in the world, APCO, spending $25 million or so, something like that, of public money to promote his image. It's an assault in a media sense of the man. So the Gujarat model was brought up. And now we are told, first to save a state and a minister from perdition, but then we are now told this is the most unique model. We have to do it. We have to generalize it. And I want to go into it, but before that, I just want to go into uh, the question of, uh, first go with Amartya Sen's the principal freedoms. Uh, Archana ran ahead of me because normally when I'm working with her, I run ahead of her. Just stay with Amartya Sen, Archana. Don't go off ahead. I'll quickly run through some slides on Amartya Sen and quote from him. He said, economics is about understanding better the nature of the world we live in, meaning it is rooted in the world. Many problems about the fairness of distribution, inequality and poverty could not be properly discussed if it is assumed that human beings have no interest in such as issues such as the justice of distribution and the balancing of efficiency and equity. We often hear in our country excessive discussions on efficiency how this will be inefficient, that will be inefficient, food security bill will be inefficient, some other thing will be inefficient, new technology will be inefficient. Yes, we need to address it. But quite often equity is equally important. And then he said, if human beings had no interest in such issues, it is not quite clear for whom we, all of us, economists and others, are trying to analyze these problems. What was his view of development in 1998 when he was awarded the Nobel Prize? He said, I'm going back to 1998 because I'll tell you how consistent he has been as an intellectual. The basic approach is that individual advantage is to be judged by the substantive freedom that the individual enjoys and that development is a process of expansion of individual freedom. And he quotes Marx and says, it has to do with replacing the domination of circumstances. People who are born in disadvantaged situations, socially, culturally, economically. And chance, by chance, I mean this girl who died in a sambar dish, who lost her life this morning, it could have been prevented, but it is chance. She was in a rural area, she was a beneficiary of a free thing, it's chance. Entire lives are disturbed by chance. And Marx said, replacing the domination of circumstances is chance over individuals, by the domination of individuals over chance and circumstances. The ability of ourselves to take over the chance and circumstance. I'll read a few more. Then there is a question, uh, then, he, then I'll just come to the five freedoms. Oh, it's back. Oh, she's printed it back and forth. Okay, this is the critical part. He discusses five different kinds of freedom. This is again already in 1998 in a frontline interview. First he says is the internal freedom. If you see the kind of censorship, the kind of attack in the name of culture, the kind of restrictions put on young women and men meeting together, like all the pub attacks that you saw and so forth, 
telling young women how to dress as if the problems of men cannot be taken care of. All this stuff deal with the questions of internal freedom. And he says, first is internal freedom, the freedom to be creative, the freedom to reason, and to think in a lucid, articulate, rational way. For that, the important policy issues are such matters as literacy, education, communication with others, and the openness of society. Very interesting that he connects in so beautifully the internal freedom to the public policy requirements of what that basis is, literacy, education, communication. A beautiful way of bringing where public policy has a role. The second is participatory freedom. Uh, freedom. Here, the principal issues are democracy and political liberty, but particularly a society that is based on public debate and discussion. Today, there is a threat to public debate and discussion. There is some connection here with ideas that have been emphasized on the one side by Habermas and on the other side in the public choice literature by James Buchanan. I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. I think it is interesting that both of them have seen democracy in terms of what Buchanan calls government by discussion, which is what is happening in our country, government by discussion. But government by discussion is happening purely as an attack and not any responsibility. There's no counter responsibility on the people who are raising the attack on government, on government by discussion, asking, how do I take care of it? You saw the hall before you came. Students were in this hall before they went. We don't have to take ownership of public places. We don't take care of many public things. So there, this government by discussion also involves participatory freedom, but with responsibility. Then the fourth is, of course, he very interesting, in 1988, he criticizes China. He says, coming to participatory freedom, I would say that despite all its successes, China's failure lies in the inadequacy of participatory opportunity. He's very clear. He's not trying to hide behind very, you know, unarguable positions. I take the democracy movement, he's talking of 1998, the democracy movement in China quite seriously and with respect. And the last is, have I gone on the fight? Sorry, before, uh, before I go to participatory freedom, procedural freedom, go back, huh? you're on procedural freedom. The third is procedural freedom. First is internal freedom, second is participatory freedom, Third is procedural freedom. Procedural freedom and legitimacy comes up particularly in the context of the rampant corruption that we see in many countries. For example, in South Asia, East Asia, and Southeast Asia. Indeed, the current financial crisis that we're witnessing has something to do with it. I'm laughing because I used to travel a lot in Southeast Asia. I used to live there and come. And I used to see how Indians would beat their breast about how, look at all this corruption in Southeast Asia. Today, you don't have any other discussion today except corruption. And it's a, it's a natural logic of the development of globalization, economy, and so forth. It is not some cancer that you can cut and take it away, put it on a Peter dish and put it in a garbage can. It is part of the larger system of the biology of development under conditions of global development. So he's talking about procedural freedom, meaning the ability to criticize not only correct thing, but procedurally. Your RTI is a procedural intervention through procedural freedom. The ability to ask questions of those who are in government of what is happening. Finally, the lack of protective freedom. Protective freedom can be illustrated by social arrangements that allow people to go into a famine and when there is nothing to stop people from falling into dire poverty, hunger, and death. The issue of protective freedom is also very serious in the East Asian, South Asian cases as it is all in 1998. Now, protective freedom, in a sense, is also talking from the, our Indian constitutional principles of two very important principles, equality before the law and protection before the law. It's not enough to have equality. You need to be protected. And uh, when, when that freedom is uh, threatened, then the rights of individuals are also taken away. And he says what we need to do is to pay attention to each of these different dimensions of freedom and that is what I try to do in my work on development and freedom. I kept this preview about the five principles of freedom of Mahathya Sen to go into my real story. My real story about the Bhagwati Sen debate, which is the Gujarat story. Um, can you just go? I'm running ahead. 
This is a very interesting book that has been recently published by one of our very prominent economists who is in the Center for Regional Studies of Jawaharlal Nehru University called Atul Sudh. Uh, 12 essays. I would suggest our students who are interested in Karnataka development, Karnataka regional development actually get the book and read it. Because one of a brilliant work of very careful economic analysis of a state. And there are almost, I think, uh, I don't know how many, about 20 or 30, more than 40 pages of tables to evidence, empirically show the evidence of the story of Gujarat. To me, this is important. Because I feel sometimes, why did we all study so much? Why did we all teach so much? Why did we go and teach in so many places? If this is the idiotic way in which we are told about state models and told this is the future for this country, I refuse to accept it. Because empirical evidence does not in any way show that there is anything unique about the Gujarat model or is there anything to say that you should tout it and use that as a false pretext to come to power. Some basic facts about Gujarat. Let's recognize certain things about Gujarat. Incidentally, incidentally I've done a lot of field work in Gujarat. I used to go at least twice or thrice a year. I've gone to many of the tribal areas and I've worked with some of the most leading nationally well-known Gandhian institutions. So I know the situation on the ground. I'm not just reading to you texts to suit an audience.